Okay, so this is the, what, maybe fourth in, in the series of what will turn out to be around a half dozen <coughs> uh, one hour lectures in solid shape. <clears throat> um, we've been talking largely about the behavior of the normal as you walk along a surface or more, at a point, or more precisely, how you, uh, as you walk a lot along a, a tangent plane locally at a, at a point, and see how the normal swings. We saw <clears throat> that this gives rise to uh, notions of principal direction, uh, principal curvature. Uh, we saw that <clears throat> places where Depending on the signs of the two principal curvatures, you could decide whether a, uh, a point was convex or concave or hyperbolic. We saw that <clears throat> concave and convex regions are called elliptic, and they are bounded by places where one of the principal curvatures crosses zero, from negative to positive, <clears throat> if you're going from a from an elliptic region to the adjoining region. And necessarily, since both, it's not generic for both uh, principal curvatures to cross zero at the same time, <clears throat> um, once you cross over, you have now one positive and one negative uh, principal curvature. And so necessarily, you're in a hyperbolic region. And so you, when you transition from a con cave or a convex region, out, out of it you cross a parabolic curve, that is to say a cap equals zero curve, and you transition into a hyperbolic region, and then you can, from that hyperbolic region, say on the other side, transition to another convex region or to a concave region. <clears throat> but you can never transition from a convex to a concave directly. Uh, um, and so in this example here, we have of, of a pear-shaped, somewhat oblong cross-section pear-shaped. You have a, a convex region here, and you have a, a uh, parabolic curve that separates it from this neck, which is hyperbolic. And then you have another, another uh, parabolic curve here that has you trans, transit up, up, out of the uh, out of this region and back to a convex region. <clears throat> uh, and when we think about line, the, 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 the curves on this surface uh, of that are whose curvature is passing from negative to positive, whose associated curvature, here it, the line of curvature here is going to be like sort of like, like that. They're going to be sort of radial lines. And these lines uh, will uh, have negative curvature here that gets closer and closer to zero, passes zero to positive, and then goes to, uh, and is positive for a while, and then it gets less positive, goes to zero, towards zero again, and then it gets to be negative as you march along these. And so it's the same integral curve that has both of these parabolic curves, okay? And by the way, we'll see later that these cur these curves have to coalesce at one of these at, at a place which is locally spherical, where both principal curvatures are the same, and that's the na the nasty place that's called an umbilic, where you can no longer follow one of these principal curves because they all come in together. Every direction's a principal curve. Uh, in any case. We have this sort of an arrangement. We have this sort of an arrangement that we've been talking about. I, I should point out here that the principal curvature is negative for this in every direction. The sort of, these are sort of the circumferential uh, lines that go, around, go along this way that are the principal curves. And they don't change sign. They're just always negative, right, in that direction. We have here <coughs> what's called a hump and a furrow. And this thing is arranged so that when you go along this way, all the principal curves sort of go along that way. And 
they um, are all negative curvature. That is to say they, that they behave in that direction like it's convex. But in the, the cross direction, you have negative, and then as you enter the furrow, it crosses to positive. <clears throat> and then as you cross out of the furrow back into the hump, it becomes negative again. And then as you cross out of that back into the furrow, it becomes negative again. Uh, uh, sorry, it becomes uh, positive again. And then as you cross out of, out of the furrow, it becomes negative again. And so you have zero crossing, zero crossing, zero crossing, zero crossing, all of the same principal curvature. Okay, <laughs> for this particular example, if you didn't have this hump, you just have zero crossing, zero crossing, and the principal, the parabolic curves go around like this and like this. And we're going to see that there's sort of very special places where the principal curve just grazes the parabolic curve. So we said it crossed the parabolic curve transversely. Uh, at most of these places, but at the very end of the hump, and likewise at the very end of the furrow, you get uh, special places where the principal curve doesn't cross zero, just becomes zero, gets tangent, if you will, the, the curve to a uh, tangent to zero, that the kappa, the principal curve that's changing sign or that's crossing zero, smoothly comes and as you march along that curve, Instead of crossing zero, it just touches. This is kappa as a function of uh, length along the uh, along the principal curve, and it just, just touches, and then and then it gets to be zero, and then stays goes back to the sign it had. So there are very special places that are, <clears throat> that are called ruffles that have that particular property, and the ruffles are very important, it turns out, in organizing the shape, just as the parabolic curves are. Okay, so that's, uh, um, and I want to say one other thing, and that is, notice that there's no umbilic in this situation, right? If everything's sort of checkerboard, there's no principal curves coming together. Uh, and we'll later examine the dimple, the, the concavity in a hyperbolic neck region at the edge of it in a, con in a convexity. And we'll see that that's also got this radial behavior, but unlike hey. the situation is going to be that one of the principal, uh, sorry, one of the parabolic curves comes from one of the families, that is to say the radial family coming out of the coming out of the umbilic at the bottom of the, well, inside the, uh, inside the concavity. <clears throat> and the other one is actually a uh, zero crossing of the circumferential uh, principal curves, quite different from that. And these very, these different qualitative behaviors are what end up al allowing you to say that shapes organize themselves into very, very, a very small catalog of, of possible shape, uh, region within region within region categories. And pretty much, in fact, no, no. Yeah, with a minor exception, I've in fact just told you about all, all of them. <clears throat> um, anyway, fine. So it's all about the behavior of the normal. And I want to say a little bit more now about the, the behavior of the, the normal as you walk in various walking directions. And so to do this, I'm going to talk about the second fundamental form operator. And we've already seen it. Uh, it, it is simply uh, something that you, you give it a walking direction, V, and out comes how the normal changes for that V. <laughs> Strictly speaking, the operator is defined this way, that you take the normal and you take the sharp of the normal. Okay, so that's a one form. <laughs> Okay, and you talk about the rate of change of the of the corresponding well of, of the dual of the normal <laughs> that one form, and that thing instead of producing a instead of producing a delta normal produces a delta of, of the one form, 
uh, and the difference between two one forms divided by epsilon, if you will, <laughs> uh, is a one form. <laughs> and so that thing is a one form and is waiting to take another, another vector in. <laughs> and that other vector is going to go into this dot place. Right? <laughs> and we're going to take this thing, it's a, it's a one form waiting to take that dot, take, take that vector. Let's call it W. And what's going on here is we're talking, W is the component of the normal swing, the component of delta n in the w direction. <laughs> OK, so we had this Roman II operator called the second fundamental form operator, or just the shape operator. And that's a very, very standard name for that, <laughs> the shape operator which takes two vector, one, one of which is the walking direction, and the other of which is the uh, direction in which you want the component of that, because the delta n is a, is a vector, and now you want the component of that vector, in the which is in the tangent plane, the com that component of that tangent plane vector that's in the w direction. <clears throat> OK, everything OK so, so far? OK, good. So OK, so we. Uh, we, I, I indicated that this Roman two operator in coordinates looks like a two by two matrix that I called M sub two. Uh, and in particular in principal coordinates, <coughs> it looks like this M sub two is represented by a matrix kappa one, kappa two, zero, zero. <laughs> All right. And moreover, if you want to compute two of e, two of VW, all you do is you do <clears throat> W, you have a representation of W in coordinates, in those principal coordinates, <laughs> W transpose. <laughs> Uh, M to V. Okay, and so it's really a very straightforward computation once you have it in coordinates. You just, and because M2 is symmetric, even if, even in, in any coordinates, you can swap the V and the W, which is a somewhat already surprising result that if you walk in the W direction and measure in the V direction, or if and look at the component in the v direction. If you walk in the v direction, take the component in the w direction, you get the same same thing, <laughs> right? And uh, and that's in fact uh, what what leads you to a, to the the two twists being the same, if you will, <laughs> uh, for any walking direction. <clears throat> and it's and it's perpendicular. So one of these is v, and the other one is v curve. <clears throat> in any case. Um, we want to get some better intuition about this walking. And so <clears throat> let us, um, first of all, uh, let's do one further thing. Assuming W and V are both unit vectors, and that's normally how you think of it. Strictly speaking, the math works perfectly well if you want to talk about curvature per multiple of unit step size rather than just a unit step size, but we'll make things simple here and just talk about unit step size, unit per unit step. And so now W, I'm going to write as in principal coordinates, uh, it's cosine phi sine phi, so this matrix W is cosine phi sine phi times P1 B2. That is to say, it's, cos it's cosine phi in the P1 direction and, and sine phi in the P2 direction. And phi is the angle from, okay, so here's the P1 and here's P2. And phi is that and W is that. It's a unit vector like so. Okay, so phi is the angle you are from the principal, uh, from the uh, first principal direction. 
And moreover, we can play the same game with w, with uh, v. So we're going to say this is cosine theta. Sine theta. P1, P2. That is to say, in principal coordinates, W is W under bar is just cosine theta sine, and it's cosine theta sine phi, and, and V in coordinates, in those same coordinates, is cosine theta sine theta. <clears throat> okay, so if there's some other direction, I don't know, is V, and, and this angle is theta. Okay? Okay, so. The first thing I want to talk about is this very important visualization notion or understanding of the, of the swing as follows. <clears throat> the idea is when you walk in a particular direction V, the normal swings into some direction. Okay, that direction is the delta N direction, right? The <clears throat> but orth orthogonal to that direction, orthogonal to the delta N, we can think of the normal swinging about a hinge, right? It's just to swing in that direction, there's a hinge and it swings about that hinge. <laughs> and so we, call, we called previously that hinge the hinge for walking direction V. So, so when you walk in direction V, you have a hinge that is swinging about, and you see on the slide that idea. <laughs> you can walk in some direction, and not necessarily uh, at some angle or, uh, to the walking direction, you have this hinge that you're going to swing around. And <clears throat> so if you think of, so C, so if you think about it, the component Uh, of a walking direction V, the component of the normal, when you measure in the direction C of V, equals, okay, how, what's, the, what's the component of the normal perpendicular to it? The change of the normal perpendicular to itself? Zero. And there's no, you know, v, right? It's all in that direction, right? And this gives us an equation immediately for this, uh, uh, for the hinge, this is zero, <laughs> allows us to use these equations here to say uh, <laughs> cosine phi, sine phi, kappa one, kappa two, zero, zero. Whoop, transpose. <laughs> um, and cosine theta. Sine theta is equal to zero. And from that, we can see that <laughs> we can solve the tan phi equals minus kappa one over kappa two times cotan theta. Okay, that's just a little algebra on that. <coughs> so that equals zero. <coughs> and so we now know what the hinge direction phi is as a function of the, and the first thing that's a little surprising is if I, this is one over tan theta, And I see that this is a symmetric equation in phi and theta. So if I'm your hinge, you're my hinge. If I walk in a particular direction, there's a hinge direction. And if I, in the very same shape, I walk in the, in the hinge direction, <clears throat> the, the hinge is the original walking direction. That's a perhaps, I mean, I assume a non-intuitive result. <clears throat> okay. so. We're going to be interested. Okay, so that is uh, a an interesting result about the hinges, and moreover, 
you can see that in a convex region or a concave region, that is to say an elliptic region, kappa 1 over kappa 2 is, is going to be positive. And so minus kappa 1 over kappa 2 is going to be negative, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and these two tangents can be one, one positive and one, one of them has to be positive and the other one has to be negative to get a negative. <laughs> and basically what that means is that theta and phi in, for elliptic situations are in not in the same quadrant, they're in the next quadrant. So if you walk in a direction, any direction in the first quadrant, this is P1, P2, you walk in any direction here, the hinge is going to be over there. <laughs> okay. And likewise, if you're in a hyperbolic region, because this is positive, if you walk in a direction here, the um, Uh, if you walk in a direction here, the hinge is going to be in the same quadrant. <coughs> so what about if you walk in the principal direction, then tangent with theta will be zero? Uh, yes. Uh, um, if you walk in the principal direction, then what follows? If it's going to be, if it's going to be some zero times something, is uh, is non-zero. How can that? The other one's got to be infinity, but tangent does take on an infinity at pi over two, <laughs> right? And so, this, so that tells you already that the the hinge for walking in a principal direction is the other principal direction. Good question. Okay, so um. We now have some information about hinges, but we also have an interest in what the values are of um, normal curvature, nosedive, what the values are for any given walking direction, what the values are of twist for that walking direction, the geodesic torsion. We're also, um, Uh, sorry, that, I'll just take those two for a start. So let's look at those. Um, oh, so, sorry, there is one more thing I want to talk about. And I want to talk about the directions of pure twist. Right? <laughs> so we talk about directions of pure nosedive, but these, these so-called asymptotic directions of pure twist turn out to be very important. And what can you see from this argument for if, if um, it's pure twist, I'm walking in this direction, and I have pure rotation about that direction, that's, that's the self-hinge. That's the C of V equals V problem, right? <laughs> So asymptotic direction is C of V equals V. Can that happen in a, uh, can that happen for a elliptic point? No, it can't happen because these two these two are separated by quadrants. There's no way they can be the same. <clears throat> so only for hyperbolic ones where the two are in the same, is it possible for them to be the same? And indeed that happens, you're not talking about theta equals phi, so, or phi equals theta. So we're talking about at a direction where tan squared theta equals minus kappa 1 over kappa 2. Now it's very clear from the equation that if kappa one and kappa two have opposite have the same sign, tan squared can't. There's no real solution to that equation. Whereas if they have opposite sign, then this is a positive number, and its square root is tan of the, tan of the angle that corresponds to alpha. <laughs> and as a result, we end up with this uh, <clears throat> this alpha, this angle 
alpha from the principal direction for hyperbolic points that is the that is the self hinged direction it's the asymptotic direction right and there's a uh, and the solution for that uh, as you can see by solving that equation is minus kappa 1 over kappa 2 to the half Okay, so now we know this, how to find asymptotic directions in this formula. And finally, I'm going to do what I promised, namely to talk about principal curvatures, sorry, uh, nose dives or uh, normal curvature. Well, K of V is defined as the component when you walk in V and measure in V, right? <laughs> that's, that's nose dive. You walk in D and the component in your walking direction is the definition of nose dive. <laughs> and so I can plug those V cosine theta sine theta and V cosine theta sine theta on both sides here. <laughs> and that result will give me, a, give, give me the formula for K, K of V. And likewise, Tau, the geodesic torsion for walking in direction, is 2 of V, V perp. <laughs> you walk in the V direction and you measure the component in the V perp direction. And if V in, in coordinates is cosine theta sine theta, then V perp is minus sine theta cosine theta. <clears throat> and you plug those into the, this formula, and sure, son of a gun, you end up with a formula for uh, twist. So this Roman two formulation, this M2 formulation, gives us a whole lot of formulas. Okay, one final thing in this, in, in, in this. and that is uh, we have this idea that when we uh, <coughs> walk, you have just said this, when we walk in some direction, there is this C, this hinge direction. By the way, the 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 fact that it's uh, symmetric, that is to say that if V goes to C, that C goes to V is what gives C its name. C stands for conjugate. Uh, 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 anyway, it's but anyway, it's the hinge direction. That conjugate is way too algebraic a, a, a name for me. I much rather think about the hinge. But when we talk about the hinge, we want to know what the rate of rotation about the hinge is. That's called the total curvature, okay? And the total curvature can be shown to be If you swing, if the component in the v direction is k, and the component in the v perp direction is tau, then it's going to be k squared plus tau squared to the half with some sign. Uh, okay, so this is called k total, and it's simply the rate of swing about the hinge. in radians per millimeter or whatever, <laughs> right? <clears throat> okay, so we have now pretty much the full catalog of curvature measures for normal swing. We have nosedive K, we have geodesic torsion tau, twist, we have principal, uh, sorry, we have uh, total curvature, and then for when we want to summarize over all walking directions, we have two principal directions, and we have uh, the two principal curvatures. And when we have those, have those, we can compute all the rest of them, and we can figure out what the hinge is. And it's all great trig. <laughs> Cosines and sines and tangents and cotangents, <laughs> right? Okay, 
So that's fine for the measures of curvature in, in some direction, normal swing. In some, uh, the component in some direction when we walk in some other direction. But we've also seen that we can summarize the overall uh, behavior at a point by <coughs> point on the surface. By well, we've seen a number of possibilities. One was okay. So you always need you need to know P one. P one is P one is an angle, right? It's a it's a direction in in the plane in the tangent plane. And a plane is just a single angle. A uh, single direction, if you will. With that, we've said that if you know if you know P1 and you know cap 1 and kappa 2, you know everything about how the normal swings for any direction. You know all this stuff. That's all you need, right? Um, we've also said that you can resolve. You can resolve kappa 1 and kappa 2 in terms of its product, which we call the Gaussian curvature K, which was the aerial spread of the normal, and the mean curvature H. This is just, H is just kappa 1 plus kappa 2 over 2. Kep, uh, K is kappa 1 times kappa 2. You, can, you get two equations, two unknowns. You can solve for kappa 1 and kappa 2 in terms of K and H, or vice versa. Uh, turns out when you do that, you end up with a uh, You get two equations, sorry, you get a quadratic equation for kappa, for our principal curvature in terms of that. It's a quadratic equation. The quadratic equation has two solutions and they are respectively kappa one and kappa two. Uh, okay, and then you, uh, those turned out to be an interesting one, but there's another very interesting pair that is used a good deal in medical image analysis uh, and other shape descriptions that somehow produces a more intuitive summary of the principal curvature possibilities than either kappa 1, kappa 2, or K and H are. But like them, you can solve for any of the other pairs from it. Right? So, you, so this is called CNS that was invented by Jan Kundrink. Uh, Uh, and what it is, is, is well, how it's defined is as follows. You, have, you make yourself an abstract space where you think kappa 1, kappa 2 falls. So it's a curvature space. Okay? And so if this is kappa 1 and this is kappa 2, then any point on a surface will, have, will be a kappa 1, kappa 2 pair. And we've made, we've made the... Uh, Assumption that uh, that kappa one is greater than or equal to kappa two. <laughs> so let's see. Yeah. Um, that um, gives us the white space. I'm going to log it off this. Every kappa one that's greater than kappa two is in this half space. Okay, and so that's the set of all possible kappa one, kappa two pairs. And now, if we think of it in a polar sort of way, okay, so we can talk about the direction in kappa one, kappa two space, and the length. The, the length is kappa one squared plus kappa two squared to the half. Ah. Uh, and the direction is an angle that we can normalize <clears throat> from, for uh, going from uh, minus 1 to plus 1 through 0. OK, so we just normalize that, that, pi, that pi swing divided by pi. Uh, and we get go, it goes from minus one to plus one through zero. And so now I have to figure out where in heck my 
uh, ideas on that. Here, there it is. Okay. So uh, here is my my uh, my general picture of things. Okay. <laughs> And so at minus one, cap, both kappa one and kappa two are, uh, have I got the wrong space? I'm feeling I do. Let's see. <laughs> um, Um, okay, so I want to, <clears throat> so I can have, <coughs> yeah, uh, so, uh, Um, okay, so I want the kappa one equals kappa two. These places, both of them, both of them are uh, positive. So this is concave. It's this one that I want. So this one, this place is kappa one equals kappa two, and both are positive. And that's the that's a pure concave circle point. Both principal curvatures are the same, right? And I have a concavity, and that's going to be the minus one situation. And that's what this picture shows. That is to say, I have here uh, the uh, on the upper left the concave umbilic. That is to say, the spherical point that is at that kappa one equals kappa two and minus uh, and sorry and and the uh, we call that the minus one point in. This half, what's happening is it's still concave, but kappa one is no longer equal to kappa two. They're both they're both positive, right? <laughs> uh, and one of them is going to lead to zero. That is, it's flattening out. So you have a, a concavity that's flatter in one direction than in the other direction. And when you get to here which is at minus a half for this index that goes from minus one to plus one is zero here, right? <laughs> um, now it, you all see this is just the angle of swing in this, uh, an the angle in this abstract space, this polar representation of kappa one, kappa two. When you're here, one of the Kappas is zero, <coughs> and the other one is positive. <coughs> and that is a gutter. <coughs> okay, it's concave in one direction, zero curvature in the other. So it's flattened out and flattened out and flattened out until it got it got perfectly flat in one of the directions. Okay? <coughs> and so uh, and that's a parabolic. A point that it is there is parabolic. And so the points that go along here are parabolic. On the other hand, at the other end, they're both negative and the same. Right? And so that's convex. 
that's the other end of the spectrum and the right right side, right end of that uh, uh, display that that figure on the top and as you move from here to here you get flatter flatter and flatter and flatter convexity <laughs> You're at a convex point, and you get flatter and flatter and flatter convexity until you have the, uh, the this ge this general picture, which is to say a tubular and the outside of a tube rather than the inside of a tube locally, <laughs> and you have flat this way and curved that way. Convex, convexly curved that way, that is to say negative curvature that way. Okay, so we've taken care of this, and now this region, the sine of kappa one and the sine of kappa two are opposite. And that's hyperbolic. <laughs> and so now what's happened is we've, for example, for coming from this direction, we've flattened out and then we go past flat. That is to say, this guy turns over and becomes set, the thing becomes saddle shaped, hyperbolic. Right? <laughs> and then um, this special place is where kappa one equals minus kappa two. Gets the name hyperbolic umbilic, and it's not important, but it's a it's a it's a saddle which is curved the same convexly and concavely in the two perpendicular directions that are the principal directions at the saddle, right? So it's just the sign of the curvature is opposite. <laughs> and okay, so the point is that this index that goes from minus one to one is captures all possibilities and it's called a shape type S. Okay, so this, this thing is this capital S that I'm talking about. That's the shape type. Okay, and on the other hand, you have the polar distance, this kappa one squared plus kappa two squared to the half. Typically, when one wants it to be a ratio kind of variable, so you take its log, but not important to the argument. The major point is that this distance variable is curvature. It's how sharply curved that shape type is. So if you have a sphere, you have a big, big sphere, right? Yeah. It has some curvature. If you make it, if you get a smaller curve, a smaller sphere, right? It's it's got greater curvature everywhere, right? So of the spherical points, this thing would be, you know, somewhere along here, and this guy would be for, further out, a higher curvature ball. But we can similarly similarly have a a, a concavity a a spherical concavity that is the inside of this ball and the inside of this ball. And they, again, are distinguished by this positive number that tells it that it's going to be uh, greater for the inside of this ball than it is for this ball. And the same thing goes for a hyper hyperbolic point. Of all hyperbolic points of any given shape type, you can make them overall flatter or overall sharper, and curvature measures that. So the point is that the CNS nicely separates the shape type on the one hand from the, the sharpness of the, of the curving. <laughs> uh, and, and therefore, it turns out to be uh, very, it's very useful in, in, in characterizing local shape. And indeed, in Kundring's lab, when he was uh, for decades a vision professor, now he's retired vision professor, but still very much doing research, but not in his old lab. Uh, um, they showed uh, very interesting co correlations between one of these measures and human perception, uh, how humans perceive shape. Okay, so I've ta now talked about CNS. That's the end of that topic. So we have these three pairs, Kappa 1, Kappa 2, KH, and CS, and we can characterize the overall shape at a point by the principal direction in any one of those pairs. Questions? Okay, so let's go on to a completely different topic. Turns out it's not so different.
Till now, we've been talking about the behavior of the normal as you walk around the surface. But now, we're going to talk about the whole frame. <laughs> okay, so we have a, a frame. Uh, if it's the principal frame, it's the normal and the uh, first principal direction and the second principal direction. But it could also be the normal and a V and a V perp. <laughs> um, in any case, we have a frame. Let's say the principal frame. And now we're going to walk in some direction, and this frame is going to rotate. And we're going to want to understand the behavior of the rotation of that frame. And so let's think about, we've already been talking about the, the rotation of the normal into P1 and P2, <laughs> or into the whole plane spanned by P1 and P2. But we're also going to be interested in the rotation of the first principal direction into its orthogonal, which is the plane spanned by the normal and P2. And likewise, we're going to be interested in the rotation of P2 and so on. So now we're going to be talking about the rotation of the whole frame. Okay. Now, we have um, two frames that we're especially interested in. For, uh, okay, so we have a frame, which is a tuple of vectors, F1, F2, and F3. Each is unit vector, each is orthogonal to the other two, each is, uh, there's, there's a right-handed rule that makes F1 cross F2 be F3, and F2 cross F3 be F1, and so on, right? Uh, and what is this frame? And on the surface, the one that we're going to pay attention to, especially, is F3 is the normal, and F1 is P1, and F2 is going to be P2. But never mind, any frame will do that we're interested in. And that's the particular one we care about. It's it's interesting because it's fitted to the surface, right? It is the normal, and it is in the two principal directions. It's special somehow for that point on the surface. <laughs> well, we similarly, I think I failed to take up my, it is, we have space curves. A space curves, a natural fitting direction, for the first one is the tangent to the curve at that point. So for these are going to be fitted frames. And on a space curve at a point, we're going to let F1 equals the tangent at that point, the tangent direction to the curve. At that point, <laughs> we have this idea that if you are fitting with a best fitting line at a point, you get a curve. If you're fitting with a best fitting plane, you get a um, you get a, a best fitting circle, planar circle <laughs> in this in that best fitting plane, and we can take the orthogonal. So the tangent is in that plane. We can take the orthogonal to the tangent in that plane, and that gets called the normal. Although it's not the, and nothing like the kind of normal that we were talking about here. It's the normal to a curve, which is simply that vector that's tangent, that's orthogonal to the tangent and in the best fitting disk to the curve. <laughs> and then we have. So that's F2, and F3 will be defined as F1 cross F2, and it gets the name binormal. It's just the, the complementary direction. And that's a frame too. It's, a, it's, fitted, to, it's fitted, fitted to a point on a space curve rather than fitted to a, a, a point on a surface. But what we're going, the math we're about to do, or the 
understanding we're about to develop is going to apply to both of them. And the point is that what we're going to be interested in is <coughs> D for some the rate of change of this whole frame for some walking direction V. <coughs> Now, on the surface, what V's are possible? The walking directions on the surface. Well, they're, they're the directions in the tangent plane, right? <laughs> okay, so there's, this is V equals alpha P1. No, I'll just call it cosine theta P1 plus sine theta P2. Right, those are the possibilities. There's a whole 360 degree possibility of walking direction, right? But for the curve, what walking directions are allowed? When you want to walk along a curve, can you, you can't walk off the curve, you have to stay on the curve. So, locally, what walking direction is that? It's T, it's the tangent. <laughs> so V is only T, and so we're only interested for the for the space curve on dt of F. <laughs> v for that that particular. Okay? Okay, so Algebraically and in and in terms of intuition, it's really hard to think about the rate of change of a vector. I mentioned this before, but we always appeal to the sharp. We turn the vector into the corresponding uh, one form. <laughs> so I'm talking about these frame vectors. So I'm going to talk about the The corresponding set of one one forms that are respectively unit parallel planes in the F1 direction, unit parallel plane measuring device in the F2 direction, and unit one F ones in the F3 direction, and those get the name sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three, and they are. Uh, they are a um, three tuple of one forms, right? And it's still just a representation of the frame, just as one forms. And they get the name. This this thing gets the name sigma, just as this is an underline, a tuple of f of three orthogonal f's. This is two, a tuple of the three corresponding orthogonal one form. <laughs> Carton, okay, so we're going to be interested then in this dv of sigma. <laughs> How for a walking direction v, the one form frame changes. And Carton, I'm so okay, so Gauss and people after him uh, struggled with that and did things that made it really hard to understand. Carton came along and said, the trick is in using the right <coughs> uh, the right frame in which to represent dv of sigma. <laughs> and in particular, the right frame is the local frame. OK, so what I want to do is, I, what, I wanna, what I realize is that dv of f is going to be a linear combination of f1, f2, and f3. And I'm going to think of dv of, dv of f as in coordinates, so much of F1 plus so much of F2 plus so much of F3. <laughs> uh, 
a plus, but so <laughs> the changes in F1, the changes in F2, and the changes in F3, but we want to talk about the changes of F1 in F1, F2, F3 coordinates. We want to talk about the changes of F2 in F1, F2, F3 coordinates. We want to talk about the changes of F3 in F1, F2, F coordinates. Similarly here, we want to talk about the changes of sigma 1 in terms of sigma 1, sigma 2 coordinates. And what that ends up saying is that Two one omega three one omega three two. Okay, I get this matrix of forms of one forms omega ij each contracted on v on the walking direction. So once I contract them, this is just a scalar matrix. <clears throat> And the fact that we're writing it in sigma coordinates means that this matrix gets multiplied by this sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, 2. <clears throat> Bunch of math. What is it saying? OK? So what it's saying is that I can talk about the swing of F1 via this omega 1, 1 and uh, omega 1, 2 and omega 1, 3 that gives me how the F1 swings in F1. It's omega 1, 1 of V, omega 1, 2 of V, and omega 1, 3 contracted on V uh, are the respective coefficients of F1, F2, and F3 that tell me how F1 changes, how F1 swings. Put another way, and this is the critical slide that I must show, and if I run over by a few minutes, I will hope you can live with it. Okay, by the way, that slide was the, the picture of the, uh, the best fitting disc on the, on the curve that I talked about. <laughs> uh, here we go. OK, so let's look at it this way. So what omega ij is, <clears throat> OK, it says for any given walking direction, so the thing it's contracted on is a walking direction, and it talks about the, the swing of the ith frame element into the j. So omega 3, 3, so omega 3, 1, if this is 3, is this. The swing of this into the first principal direction. Right? We know what that is. That's a nose dive, right? <laughs> but I mean, that's, that, that's what that describes. Omega 3, 2 talks about the swing of the normal into the other, into the other direction. Omega 1, 3 is the component of F1 in. The three direction. Okay, so omega i j is the swing of the ith frame element into the j element, into the j frame element, and that gets measured as a function of walking direction. And the fact that this Cartan idea, where you write the derivatives of sigma in terms of sigma, makes this pretty simple idea. 
And the reason is <laughs> that you can show that all, I mean, you know intuitively that all frames can do is rotate. And the fact that they can only have rotations ends up meaning that this matrix, this matrix here is anti-symmetric. It's got zeros on the it's zeros on the diagonal, meaning omega one. Uh, I mean, so F one has no swing in its own direction. It only swings into F two and F three. <laughs> and then you get omega one two over here and minus omega one two here, and you get omega. Uh, I'll call omega three one here, and omega minus omega. Uh, here it is, minus omega 3, 1, 3, 1 here. And you get omega 3, 2 here, and minus omega 3, 2 there. It's anti-symmetric. And what that basically says is you need to know three one forms, omega 1, 2, omega 3, 1, and omega 3, 2. And you know everything about the, how the whole frame goes. There are three one forms that apply to the walking direction. And uh, omega 3, 1 is about the swing of the normal into the first frame, the first tangent plane direction, omega 3, 2 into the second. They're both about the normal. That's what we've been talking about. And the last one we haven't yet been talking about. And it's the swing of one into two. That is to say, what happens this way, which it has to do with how the principal curves curve. And OK, so I'm going to stop now. The basic point is that we can do this. And when we do it, we're going to be able to apply it to our, our, three base, our two basic frames, one for a surface, the principal curves, and one for the for the tangent walking direction on the curve. And that's going to give us essentially all our information about the whole curvature situation, the, how the whole frame behaves on the one hand for a surface point and on the other hand for a curve. We'll do that next time.